Uh, folks, so we're going to kick it off. Uh, my pleasure to uh, to welcome Mozi. Uh, so uh, Mozi was born and raised in Lazi, which is south of Durban here. Um, he's a course facilitator and sys admin at Explore Data Science Academy. And he's going to be talking to us here today about the joys of using the service. Right, um, thank you so much. Hi everyone, uh, yeah, my name is Muzi and today I'm going to be talking with you the joys of uh, serverless functions. Um, right, a uh, bit about me, I've already heard, heard some stuff, uh, other stuff is uh, I work for a company called Explorer. We pretty much do data projects, like think large scale like applications like um, SCOM size, telecom size, network. Um, also, we also do digital twins. Like if you have like some any type of network, like water network, electrical network, and you wanna see that entire thing, um, or you wanna see that entire thing digitally. So we go around just putting you know, hundreds, or thousands of sensors all over the place, just to see how the water is flowing, if there's any leaks, and also through the AI applications, try and predict if the the pipe running down in some sort of type of main street is actually gonna burst in the next few weeks or not. Um, also, another big thing with Explore AI is that Explore AI actually has an academy, which is where I, which is what, which is the part of the business that I'm working. So the academy teaches data skills. Like we teach, there's a, there's a long form course on data science. There's another long form course on data engineering, and that's where the course facilitator part comes in, and that's where also the sysadmin facilitator comes in because they. We have hundreds of students using um, our, our cloud account, which is at this moment pretty much our AWS account. Hence, the reason for this talk, which basic, basically we use a lot of service functions to pretty much manage the manage the accounts. So yeah, what is um, a serverless function in general? Right? So it, it's, it's a function, right? like think Python function. It exists for a single purpose, and it does something useful, useful in a cloud environment. So cloud environment doesn't necessarily need to mean AWS or Azure or anything like that. So that's part of cloud. It can also be private cloud. It can also be something that's set up um, on, on, on prem, but it's a cloud. Right. Single function does something useful. The useful part for me is very important. Uh, it has to be clear <laughs> why that function exists. Uh, it's because you can actually use yourself in just creating a whole bunch of functions that call each other and uh, yeah, okay, you may not lose track. But, um, another thing with serverless functions is because it's a function, a function in programming needs to be called for it to do something. So with serverless functions, they are triggered by mainly two things, either a schedule or, um, or an event. Right? So schedule is it. Yeah, a schedule or a cron job or anything like that. And if that can be anything, someone switched on a server, someone closed the server, someone made a call to something, or even an external event, like, uh, an external resource uh, sent a call to somewhere, or an IoT device sent a call to um, maybe a proxy or a gateway or anything like that. That could spin up your server function. Also, this one is very important. Serverless functions, no matter where you go, Okay, most places that I know of, they are stateless and ephemeral. Meaning, it doesn't remember anything, it doesn't care about what you did, what the other one did, or what the next one's gonna do. It doesn't know anything. It wakes up, it works, and the ephemeral part is, it gets deleted. So you all, it always wakes up, work, do some work, and then it gets deleted. Right, can scale to millions of requests. I've never gotten to a part where I had to worry about performance. Hopefully one day I'll get there, but yeah, I'm not there yet, right? <laughs> Uh, pay as you go, really important, really, really important, especially if you're trying to create stuff and you're, running, you're trying to create a startup and you, your major, you want to run a major application and you have no clue how many people are actually going to visit your site, right? So it is really good that you only pay for when your functions are running. If they're not running, that's it, you, know, you, you don't pay. Um, yeah, when you get serverless functions, Again, every, most cloud provider, providers uh, provide uh, serverless functions, but for this talk, I will be focusing mostly on AWS, as it is the cloud provider that we use where I work. And it's actually the only one I know how to, that I actually have practical experience in. So yeah, let's talk about serverless functions in AWS. And then, yeah, they are called um, 
the service that uses uh, serverless functions called AWS Lambda. So yeah, use cases. Again, um, when you when you want to use any serverless function, you pretty much just insert anything on the on the, on the cloud or in the internet. If it can make a, an API call, you can work with it. Right. Um, automation. So our account at Explore, by the end of this year, more than a thousand people, yeah, more than a thousand users would have used one account. So for that, to manage the cost of the missions and everything, a whole lot of automation has to happen. You need to keep track of who created what, when, um, and sometimes even the cost involved in terms of that specific resource that was used at any given point in time. So automation is huge. Right? Another huge one for, for myself is sometimes we forget to switch things off. It doesn't matter how much experience you have. Sometimes either a student is going to use some very expensive uh, EC2 server that does some GPU uh, modeling thing and then just go for lunch and forget to turn the thing off and it starts cutting off costs. So the automation there, you actually have certain things that Go, you have lambda functions that go in and look at whether the, the, the server has been used or not. And if it hasn't been used over a specific period of time, it just switches, the, switches it off. It doesn't terminate it, uh, but only switches it off. So automation is a huge thing uh, for, for server functions. This is, that's just one example. But right? also, you can use functions as a backend. Now, when I started working with Python, my inspiration or my main focus was on doing something with the web. So I went from knowing nothing to trying to work with Django uh, in, the, in this time. And the experience was, was, was not the best, right? So with, with serverless functions, instead of worrying about everything that you have to worry about, especially in the backend side, uh, instead of worrying about the, the models, um, the, the logic, the setting, making sure that your uh, Cycle PG2 is set up correctly with the, other, with, the, with the SQL Server and everything. If you have the serverless backend, the only thing that you're mostly worried about is just the function and the connection to the database. So they are really great as a function as a backend. Right, uh, quick to deploy. It's one function. You can do it in, in a couple of minutes or in a couple of hours, depending on your know, experience and what you're trying to do. Uh, yeah, so. I've been talking a lot, so <laughs> let's, let, let's, let's look at uh, a couple of things of, of how you actually um, use serverless functions. Right, so I'm, again, we're using AWS, or I use AWS, so this is the, the example of a serverless function. This is a Lambda function, this is an actual screenshot of a function. So with this, it's Python code. The first two, the first two lines are just imports. Import JSON, import them from the standard library. The second one, import portal 3. So portal 3 is your, is your Python SDK inside of, inside of um, AWS. And then 3 is your basic Python uh, function definition. Uh, definition, um, this one is lambda handler. It only takes two arguments, events and context. So event is the thing that caused it to, to is the actual trigger. Whether it was um, a schedule or some type of event, that's where you're going to get the information from. And then context is pretty much the settings of the Lambda function itself. As in uh, how the, the, the setup is. It can either be the default setup, or you might have also wanted to play around with the amount of memory that you want your, your function to have, or maybe the timeouts or anything like that. But we, we seldom use context, but it, 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 it does depend okay, on a case by case basis. Yeah, so with this one, the, the main reason that this function exists is is to switch off an instance. Meaning, if I forgot, if, it, if it's a Friday and I left early and I forgot to switch off the instance, this thing has to wake up and make sure that the instance is stopped. So I have my server ID or instance ID on line six, and then on line nine. So how Oro3 works as an SDK, whether you're using Lambda functions, the CLI or anything, you have to first connect to a service. And then once you've connected to a service that you wanna interact with, only then you can connect to a resource within that specific service. So line 9 is connected to the EC2 service. That's pretty much all about remote servers, if you've never used EC2. So that's your remote server. And then on line 12, that's what I'm saying, OK, now that I have the client that connects to EC2, using this client, go and stop these instances. So in this case, I'm just passing a list of instances, but only have one. So it's just going in and stopping one instance and then after that, I'm on 9.13. You see there, I say 
if I print stop response, nice thing with, with Lambda specifically is if you print out anything, you're actually sending it to the logs. So I'm just logging the response and then returning um, a JSON response saying code 200 and then uh, send, sending back the, the response again. So this one function exists, it exists for one thing and that is to stop eight instance uh, at a specific time. You might find that you're stopping this one using some type of cron job, saying maybe every day at 7 p.m. or maybe uh, once, I don't know, can be anything. Uh, whatever shape you can you want to use. And you can also have multiple triggers on the same function. So this is one example. Okay. So how did I know what to write on line 12? Again, the borrow 3 SDK is huge. It is, it is really, really huge. So uh, you don't try to memorize everything, but it does help to Google the docs. Right? So with this one, if you're going to be using anything with a specific service, it's just a matter of Googling uh, borrow 3 EC2, and then in this instance, I want to stop the instances. And uh, okay, the important thing, one of the important things to note about the docs is it, there are a lot of arguments that can be passed on each call or on each method, but you don't need it to necessarily pass everything. If you're looking at, the, at this one, the, the, the stop instances method actually has four arguments, and only one of them is required, which is the instances ID. So I didn't even bother with all the other three. I just passed in the, 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 the list of IDs, and that's it, and, and it works. So that's one example. So now, if this was a complete infrastructure, it would look like this. It would be just three services. One is event bridge that actually triggers the, 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 the Lambda function. And then it's the Lambda function itself that has the code uh, required to stop the instance. And then lastly, we will be connected to the EC2 instance, EC2 service, where we actually switch off the EC2 instance. So, you're pretty, uh, it's really rare to see an infrastructure diagram that looks like this, but it does help to, to get started, right? So this is uh, one basic one. Okay, so here's a second um, Lambda function. This function is different, is, is very similar to the first one. And, then, and that is, um, we still have imports at the top, but if you look at line three, there's a new import there. We're actually importing the request line. Um, and then from that, function definition. So what this one is doing is, I want it to actually send me the Bitcoin price every day. I'm not willing to miss the next bull run. So every day, I want to get an email telling me what the price is. And that is the reason this function exists. So what happens then is, we're using um, a platform called Bitstamp. So that's the endpoint if you want to get the, the ticker for, for Bitcoin USD. And on 910, we're just sending the, the get request to, to Bitstamp. Um, and then after that, just basically, just basically taking the, um, the response content on line 11 and then just sending it to, to JSON, into JSON data. And one of the keys inside of that response is last. So last is, what is the last price someone or something bought a Bitcoin for? And that to me is the actual price of Bitcoin. Not someone, not what someone is asking for it, but what price did anyone, someone bought buy for buy, buy Bitcoin? So in line 40, we have the price, but it's in US dollars, right, right? So now I need to send it to my email address. And how I do that is I log in, I connect to a service called SNS, which is called Simple Notification Service. So it's pretty much a pub sub um, service. And how SNS works is it needs a subscription, and sorry, it needs a topic, and each topic uh, has endpoints uh, or resources that subscribe to it. So with this one, I called my topic general topic. So if you look at that long string, that's pretty much the serial code uh, for my topic, which is an Amazon resource um, something. But it's a serial number from, from, for my topic. Uh, I don't know why I call it general topic, but it is my topic. And then in line 19, I'm just pretty much saying, hey, SNS Live, please publish this message. And the message is going to uh, a topic that's in line 20. And the message is, Bitcoin price is uh, F string, using F string, and then the last price, and then the subject of the actual image, of the actual image, so the image, email is the, uh, the BCC USD price today. So this Lambda function has a trigger that gets triggered once a day, every day, because I don't have a problem paying for a Lambda function, but I, I really, really do not want to miss the next move. 
So yeah, every day I get an email. Right? So another big thing to note about serverless functions, okay, especially <coughs> lambda functions, is that a lambda function actually has a specific backend, and this backend comes with very few things. Yes, you do have Python uh, pre-installed. Yes, you have Boto 3 pre-installed because it is um, Amazon's own uh, SDK. But that's pretty much it. If you want to use any third-party library, you're going to need to pull it up there. You're going to need to upload it uh, or connect, find a way to connect it somehow to a Lambda function. So that request library is not, Amazon doesn't have it. So you need to go get it somewhere. And that's where the idea of layers comes in. So your, your code, you can actually bring in that party uh, libraries using, uh, using layers. One of the quickest ways of doing that is pretty much just getting pre-configured layers. Like there are people who collect or, or, or create layers, I don't know if for a living or as a hobby, but there's a couple of <laughs> GitHub repos that are just full of um, Lambda layers. Uh, this is one of one of the one of one of the repos that where I find like on, where I found um, the add-in for this one. It's a lot of packages. You see, at the beginning, at the top, there's beautiful so NumPy pandas, and then right at the bottom, I don't know if you can see it, but that, that's where the request is. The only thing you need is the add-in. So you just copy the add-in and then just uh, add it to a Lambda function. And then the next big question becomes: What happens if you cannot find a pre-existing add-in? So that requires you to create what is known as a deployment package. So, but then what, what, what that happens is you pretty much um, create an environment, uh, load your, your Python binaries and the, the third party package, zip it up, and send it to Lambda. And then that's how you get your, 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 your Lambda layer, your custom Lambda layer. But for me, I don't, I don't even try it. I just Google existing Lambda layers um, because I, I use uh, no mostly popular packages. And then if I don't find a chair, then we go in the deployment package, uh, package route. Right. Another architecture diagram. Similar to the last one, event bridge wakes up my Lambda, I don't know at what time, Lambda goes and fetches the Bitcoin price. Once it has the Bitcoin price, a, a, a message is sent to SNS. SNS then actually sends an actual email to my email address. Uh, so that I can see what the Bitcoin price is, and this is an actual screenshot from my from my Gmail account with all the messages that have been coming in from the from the Lambda function. Uh, on the fourth of October, it was somewhere around 19,000, 19.6,000. Then it went up to 20, and then it dove down again. On the 11th of October, it was 18,000. That one I missed. So, but yeah, on <laughs> yesterday it was somewhere around 19,000 19, US dollars per Bitcoin. So, this is an actual um, infrastructure. Yes, it is small, but it, it does something useful. So, uh, that's uh, just another example of what you can you can use serverless side functions for. So, right, what about backends? How do you how do you work with backends when it comes to serverless functions? So. Almost everything I'm talking about now can be done across the board. Azure, GCP, uh, Netlify, uh, IBM, Alibaba, they all have a pretty much a similar setup. So when it comes to backends, I'm now going to introduce you to my very good looking, what do you call it, thing, landing page. Right? So let's say you develop something, you have your, you have your fancy landing page, and you're collecting people's email addresses. Uh, how do you now have a backend that collects email addresses and then just I don't know, stores them somewhere? Right. So for that, uh, let's, just, let's, let's just actually go to the, to the website. Right. So this is my fancy landing page. Right. You can put whatever you want, you want here. Right. The, on the front end, it's just bootstrap. This is a bootstrap template. Yeah. Bootstrap template, it has a form with one input and then a place for people to just Submit. So let's say a person is sold, like they really like my startup, they're thinking, Flip, this is the next thing, uh, this is the next next thing. So what they can do then is come here and then just, I don't know, uh, let's just say type in the email address. Uh, for example, we're going to say this one is Lucy and okay, doing it like this is kind of strange. Right, so the email address is Lucy at email.com. 
And then the next thing that the old form just gets submits, it sends an asynchronous uh, call to the back end and then gets back a response. This response is the actual response that comes back from the back end of my, of my of the system. So with this, uh, you might be tempted to want to use class or any type of web, web framework, but this in the back end is actually using a single lambda, a single lambda function. And also another important thing that I'd like to show you is, so how is the call actually made, or where is it going? How does this website know how to actually trigger a lambda? Right. And for that to happen is, okay, let me just do it right here. What am I using? Oh, okay. Okay, this has not been shown in my different <laughs> Or I'm trying to see. Okay, wait, I do have uh, an idea. I'm going to right click here and just use source. So, this entire landing page is one HTML file. Everything in one place. Yes, I could virtualize and set the CSS in one, in one file, put the JavaScript somewhere else, but no, I'm using one file. <laughs> so, and somewhere down here is the actual JavaScript. Right. So with this, uh, yeah, you're not familiar with the JavaScript. So what's happening here on line 179 is I uh, pretty much just get uh, the form uh, and, and create a, a, a variable from it. And then I listen to specific events related to the form. As in, if that form, if anyone clicks submit, the very first thing you do is you catch that event, but, and then do not do whatever you, uh, you, know, you normally do in form. So I just prevent defaults, and then from that, I write down the loading, uh, you can put a spin up, I just put the text loading. And the important bit is here is I get the value of what was typed in on the email. And there is a new variable here, there's a variable called a API URL. And when you look at the API URL, that URL is actually a URL that you get from a service called uh, API Gateway. So API Gateway uh, is, a, is a managed service within AWS that pretty much helps you to create APIs uh, with speed. And the nice thing about this API is it's actually in South Africa. So my API is, in, I know it's in somewhere in Cape Town. I don't know if it's, I mean, just playing Cape Town or, or Stellenbosch, but it's somewhere there, right? It's, it's in South Africa, right? That really helps with latency. These things are really fast if your if you're, if, if you're, if you're things are actually inside the country, right? And then probably I just get the email, and then I uh, send a sequence um, request. But where I send it is, I send it to wherever, where I, wherever I want. Not where the form thinks it should be sent. I just tell him, send this thing to this URL that I'm giving you now, and it's a post request, and then I just have the email uh, sent as a, I just have the, the body sent as a, as a, as a as JSON data. So it's the key is the email, and then the value is the actual email that the, the user type in. Right. And and that's pretty much it for for the front end. And then on the back end, okay, this thing is going to help. Okay. We are now inside of Intel. So what I want to show this there's a there's a service called DynamoDB. So DynamoDB is a database service. So it's a managed no SQL database. I really like working with these types of databases because you don't define much except for the keys. And as, as, except for the key. And then that's it. Everything else you just create. There's no there's no schemas. I don't need to uh, put anything in fourth third or fourth normal form or anything like that. So <laughs> yeah. So it's a no SQL database. So the, the database um, they're called tables here. So my table name is Michael's and a email collector database. So I can actually view what's inside of here. So by exploring items, okay, let me click this one. And where am I? Okay, 
this thing is happening. I actually want to show there you go. So the, the email that we just sent came in and here and here, here it is. Right. And the nice thing with this is all of this is just one is um okay, let me go back to the presentation. So the nice thing with this is in the, in, this is how the infrastructure for this application looks like. So we have users as our data we start go uh, we make uh, using the we use the web browsers to visit my lovely landing page, but the actual landing page sits inside of uh, object storage. So there's something called S3. So S3 is pretty much your external hard drive. Just think of it like that. Uh, it, you can just throw anything in it, but it is object storage. So as in, um, so it's object storage, it's one file, it's an HTML file. So everyone who tries to visit my landing page is actually going to S3. And then from S3, uh, when you make, when the sub submission is made, that submission goes to API Gateway, and then API Gateway decides where to send the request. That's the, that's the important thing with API Gateway, because you can send your requests anywhere. You can send them to um, Lambda functions, which are serverless. You can send them to EC2 instances, which are actual servers. You can send them to um, load, balance, load balancers, whatever. You can send your requests to whatever. But this is a talk about serverless functions. So <laughs> my request is going to a serverless function. And then some of the function pretty much just takes the email and then saves it onto a database. And yeah, that's, um, that's oh, another thing to note is that um, this, all of this is happening in Kata. Right? That's where the API is, that's where the bucket is, that's where the, the, back, uh, the Lambda function is, even the, even the, the, the database. So latency is, is really small, so this thing is really fast. So if my landing page gets 10,000 visitors today, it would, it would hang all of that without a sweat, right? Even 100,000 without a sweat. Not sure about millions, but that would be a nice problem to have. Right? So <laughs> this, is my, this is my setup for now. Right, um, but what about the bigger? What about something that has, I don't know, what are those fancy JavaScript frameworks in the front end? What about, what if, what if, what if you have that? It uses view or yet or the next big thing that came out yesterday from the JavaScript world. And how do you how do you handle that? Right? So I actually have an example of that. Uh, my aunt and, and her husband have a, a chemical manufacturing company. So they have this one client that has multiple offices, and then when they buy, they don't send a consolidated order. They just get a call, and then the girl goes, "Oh, that those, those guys need one, two, three, four, and those guys need one, two, three, four." And those guys want to need one, two, three, and then everything's fine. And then she calls again the next day saying, oh, no, flip. Those other guys don't need that anymore because of, yeah, so it, it comes a mess. Right? So they asked me to help them out and create something. So this is a React um, JS uh, application that we are going to go to now. The main aim is to pretty much just create orders for multiple branches, but it's the same company. So there's one person or there's one office that's paying, but the orders are going um, are going to, or the deliveries are going to go to different uh, repos things, so they're going to go to different branches. And it looks, oh, okay, zoom out, excuse me. So let's, let's just do something quick here. Let's say the first branch is going to order, what is that? Uh, some air freshness. <coughs> And second branch is going to order uh, what do people order the chemical companies? Uh, I know this is something to clean stores. Uh, I don't know what this part is for, but it's some part of it used to clean something. Right. So this is the order from branch number two. And then from this, yeah, they can just view what what the, what the entire company order. The first table is pretty much a consolidation order. It shows everything. And then uh, it shows, uh, it breaks down the quantities by branch by branches. So this is all happening in the front end using ReactJS. But the, the, where the magic happens in, in the back end is, what happens um, if the, the client says, okay, this might, this is the order, but they wanna finish it later on, right? So they can actually just click save order, and this is gonna send um, the entire order into the back end where it will be saved. And then now, the next time they wanna do something, they can just copy the order number and then retrieve the order and continue to work, with, work on it. Um, what I really like is that they can actually just download the order as, as a PDF. 
which is which is what I think is really cool. But okay, the important bit is how does the infrastructure for such an app look like in the serverless backend? So that's that's when you actually start doing interesting um, infrastructure diagrams. So infrastructure diagrams are really important when working in the cloud, and especially when working um, with, with serverless backends, because you have your entire application spread out through multiple um, functions and, and services and everything. So it does have to have uh, something that shows you how everything connects together. So with this one, what happens is, from my from the developer's laptop, so let's say my laptop, from my laptop, I, I use I run, up, run up, create the code, and I push everything to GitHub. And using uh, CICD from GitHub, everything is sent to uh, a service called Amplify. So Amplify is um, similar to something like what Firebase in Google. Right? So Amplify actually ho will host the front end, which in this case is a full blown uh, Next.js front end, and will also uh, handle the CICD from GitHub. So whenever I push anything to me, uh, Amplify will be notified, it will read, uh, read, read the app, and then um, deploy it again. And the nice thing about Amplify is you can actually have, uh, have your app in multiple stages inside of Amplify. So there's a main, uh, main stage, dev stage, um, the other contractor stage, whatever, whatever, however you want to you uh, configure things. Right? And then from Amplify, again, when the request comes from um, from the users, Amplify it goes to API Gateway, like the normal, the normal routes, API Gateway to Lambda, and then the order gets saved onto DynamoDB. What is coming next, uh, especially for this app, is uh, user authentication, because you see all the, you saw it in the front end, I wasn't asked for my login credentials. But that, you can actually add that using a uh, service uh, similar to a service like uh, Amazon Provito. And then also another thing is, uh, whenever an order is submitted, uh, SNS can just send an email to the receptionist at, at the company so that they know that hey, this client has now made a new order, and then um, and then they can go about actually calling or verifying the order, and then putting things together and shipping the client. So this is just a, 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 a something to take note. Uh, this, so this is how uh, a full blown application can be handled. The nice thing about um, about how about um, Amplify and also AWS at this point in time is you can actually also host multi tenant applications uh, using this exact setup. Whereby it's one application, but it's used by multiple companies and multiple people inside of those companies. Uh, but yeah, the, the network diagram might change a bit, like you might add, you might go like maybe three times to, three times to, the, to the size, but it is possible. Right, and then so yeah, I've been hyping serverless functions like crazy. Right? So what's the catch? Because there's always a catch, right? Catch number one, serverless does not mean no server. There is always a server, right? And you have to know that server, or at least you have to know the configuration of that server. Long story short, it's a, it's a Linux server. It's a Red Hat uh, flavor, but Amazon has their own flavor of Red Hat that they implement with, with Lambda. But yeah, it's a Linux server. Uh, that really helps when, when it comes to troubleshooting and debugging. Like if you write code that was designed for a, a Windows server and, and only to get to the format on Lambda, it's easy to know why. Like you're writing for the right, wrong operating system. So serverless does not mean no server, there is always a server somewhere. Right. Two, there's something called the code start. So code starts similar to like a car. It's been sitting in, in the snow for a day or so. If you try to start it, sometimes it's issue starting up. Same story with serverless functions. So if it, if it has never run, it means that server, the actual server that's running, it's going to run the code, has never had to deal with this code. So you find that sometimes um, it takes a bit of time uh, to start. However, these things are so fast that you, most of the time, will never not have to deal with the code starts. Unless if your application is a high performing, high performing application where milliseconds are important, but it is something to to be mindful of. Also, the another problem with uh, serverless functions um, is that you, they actually lock you into a specific setup and also a specific cloud provider. So specific setup is in there's a national server in the back that's running the code. You're locked into that. So that's, but that's easy to deal with. 
more servers are running Linux, you can sort of maneuver your way around it. But the other big problem is you're locked into a specific cloud provider. Borrow 3 is an AWS um, SDK. So if your code is, if you're using Borrow 3 all over the place, it means you're always going to be using AWS. And if your manager comes and says, hey, you know what, those AWS people are not nice, we're now moving to Azure, you're going to have a problem. So that's another uh, issue with, with serverless functions. And vice versa, you have to move from a different cloud provider to um, AWS or someone else. Yeah, yeah, you get locked in pretty quickly. The more, the more you, the more you use, but it's, but it's the same everywhere. The more you use a specific cloud provider, the more locked in uh, you are to a specific provider. Right. Another gotcha, another issue that you have with serverless functions or deployments in general is the architecture can get confusing pretty quickly, especially to someone who's not used to uh, cloud native um, deployments. Right. So if it's just one. Um, HTML page, they spam people's e emails. It's much easier to understand because you only have one lambda function. But if you have a website like, I don't know, let's say you're, you have, you're running Instagram and you're running the entire thing on, on the serverless um, on, on architecture, you are going to have dozens, if not hundreds, of lambda functions floating around. And those lambda functions are going to be connected to both each other and also to other services. Uh, so the architecture looks like a like a maze. And sometimes you actually do need time to sit, zoom in, read, zoom out, uh, go have some coffee, come back, zoom in, just to understand what's happening. And that is provided that the person who actually created the application took the time to write down the architecture diagram. Because if they didn't, then you have problems. Then it's about following the request, the logs, and yeah, it can get tedious. But this can be somewhat circumvented by using uh, services such as Amplify. Because Amplify, what it does is, it pulls everything together into one place. Like it does certain things for you, but it keeps the code together. Like you know that this specific um, front end is connected to function number one, two, three, four, five, which is also connected to database number one, two, three. So uh, it does get better like that, but yeah, they can, yeah, they can get out of hand. But uh, another big thing, but this is the problem with all cloud providers. Not all services are available in all regions. So AWS has a lot of regions. There's, 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 there's Cape Town, there's a whole lot of US, um, South America, um, um, Europe and everything, but not everything is ever available everywhere. Like if you saw here in my architecture diagram, right? so this one, the one we identified, is actually sitting in Ireland. So this application is sitting in Ireland. But the, this one, uh, where on my landing page, this one is sitting in Cape Town. Why is that? So why, why did I just put everything in Cape Town? The big issue is, OK, for now, anyways, the big issue is the passing. Uh, OK, I'm going the wrong direction. And the big issue is the service uh, Amplify is not available in Cape Town yet. Hopefully it is going to be available sometime soon, but this is another problem that you run into with the uh, cloud, um, cloud native, uh, uh, cloud -native uh, uh, architectures. Right? Your, your thing might depend on a, on a couple of services only to find that you have one service that doesn't exist in a specific region of your choice. And then you have to make a decision. Say, do, we try, do we send the request or do we send the data, do we copy the data there? Uh, oh yeah, if you try to copy anything from one region to the next, you get charged. That's another torture, but this is a cloud, it's a cloud, cloud thing in general. But with this one, Amplify was not available, or is not available in, uh, in, 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 in here in South Carolina, in the Cape region. So this thing, which meant I had to just build this entire thing um, on the island region. So that's another huge torture or issue or headache which you might find yourself uh, needing to deal with. So what some people do, uh, what like boy says, what we do, we just pick one region that has all of the services uh, that we normally use. Uh, where was I? Another project. Right. So all in all, using your current Python skills you, and a serverless backend, you can pretty much create a lot of useful things. They don't necessarily need to be stuff you do for work. It can be just a hobby, or it can be just, I saw some guy on the internet 
it, it created um, something that with water is is uh, is plans for you, and then it sent request uh, it sent a request telling him what, uh, how much water was used, how much moisture was in the soil, and everything. And and back end was a serverless, so it was useful, even though it did not have monetary value for him, but he could feel better knowing that his, his plants were water. So yeah. Yeah, which are normal Python skills and a, and a function or a couple of functions, you can be one heavy developer. And yeah, guys, that is it for me. Are there any questions? Anyone speaking in It's up to you. How can you do it? You need to. You, you always need a source of truth with, with, with any with any type of development. Right? So amplify actually comes with an amplify uh, CLI that helps you set up your your, your environments. So with the CLI, you actually create your functions and you design them locally, like you work on them locally. So if you want to change anything. You change it locally and then you push it inside. And that's how you make, um, that's how you, you modify anything. So it's, uh, that way, we cannot, that's not the only way, but it is the safe way of doing it. Another way is, at the end of the day, if the Lambda function is sitting on it, you can just log in, go to the Lambda function and change it. <laughs> but that, that's going to cause some problems down the road when, when things get misaligned. So yeah, the safe way is just use the CLI, and then uh, the CLI is going to help you to uh, make sure that everything um, is up to date on Git, but and because you're using CICD, Amplify is always also going to be up to date. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm curious about <laughs> Alright, so that we got it, it, um, a couple of things. It, uh, there's always there are alternatives. So Amplify's advantage is that it's it's AWS's own um, service that helps to to that helps you to pretty much create a uh, cloud native deployment. You also have um, stuff like uh, the self service framework where that the service framework can help you deploy it into any cloud provider. Uh, what else is there? You have your telephones, you have, uh, there's a whole host of, uh, of things. The, what helps is, the first thing you have to be clear on is, are you going to use multiple providers or not? Right? So if you're using multiple providers, maybe Azure and AWS, so you can at that point move away from maybe Amplify and just use something like the serverless framework or Instagram. But if you're only going to be using AWS, so AWS has that um, has something that's designed by them and has a whole uh, whole host of functionality that you can use um, with, with, um, with, 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 the, with the cloud provider. And another thing is the interesting bit is all of these things at the end also depend on a specific service inside AWS. The service called uh, Cloud Formation, which is infrastructure as code. So it's similar to Telephone. So it's it's, a, it's lower level but it can allow you to do whatever. Like, it is scary powerful. <laughs> you can create the pretty much the next Facebook using your own file, right? So, that's a, not, that is another option. But another thing is, how much complexity do you want to deal with? Right? That's another uh, issue, that's another decision you need to make, right? So, if, you, if the thing that you're building is big and everyone in the team understands how infrastructure as code works, uh, you can just, Go to uh, cloud formation or telephone or, or, or serverless when you can just create things from there. But if not everyone is familiar with that, uh, a service like Amplify has that visual aspect to everything that you that you that you that you work on. 
So it does have the kind of pronunciation. There's another one called Summit, not Summit, CERN, uh, inside AWS. And CERN is similar to the serverless framework, but it's specifically for, for AWS, and it can actually help you to test out your Lambda functions working. So it's one of the things that you just need to research what options are there, and you just pick from the one and put your points. Any other questions? Get a second track. Yeah, Mr. Kaiser. You know, I think particularly that combination of API Gateway and Lambda, that's a really nice one. I was wondering, have you explored it with the other big vendors? Um, you know, they're putting in products in Azure and GCP and stuff. What's your experience like? Right. So that's an easy one to answer. <laughs> 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 right. uh, okay, I haven't experienced it with, with, the, with, the, under, uh, uh, sorry, with the other vendors. The big reason is uh, where I work, we're pretty much, we're pretty much uh, dependent on, on, on AWS, but that's only the academy side. Right? So the guys, uh, there's a section called utilities. Those guys, they actually use Azure. So if anything comes up, Asia related, I just kick forward. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I will have an answer for you next year because starting the fourth form next year, I'll be looking also to uh, on using Asia and then looking at the differences, uh, pros and cons, and so on and so forth. Last question. So using services in different regions is tends to be an issue in, in a variety of ways. It's pretty much how the cloud is designed or how it is designed. So all in all, the, someone once said, I don't know where I swear I said this, that there's no cloud, it's just someone else's computer. So AWS has a whole host of data centers that are linked, that are spaced out in a specific way. So regions are just clusters of data centers. So if you have something for your staff all in one region, the latency is, is, really, is, really, is really screwed because they might have one um, data center here, one, two kilometers out, or maybe one in the next door. So everything happens uh, pretty quickly in one, in one place. Where the problem begins now is if anything has to leave this specific region and go to a different region, then now the, the traffic is no longer internal to that region. It has to take in, into, into consideration everyone else who's making a call to that other region. Um, so the latency gets, uh, gets hit. And also another big issue with mixing regions is AWS's uh, revenue model. So what, they, so what AWS does, I'm not too sure what the other cloud providers do, but if you need to send anything to an a, a AWS region, it's actually free. You can send gigs of data to S3, and they'll just gladly accept it. But if you ever try, to take the same data and move it out, then you get charged. And the definition of out is not out of AWS, it's out of the region. So you actually get charged for when you have to move data in between regions as well. Like it can be almost anything, sometimes even copies of data, or if you need to make an image of your of your of your instance, right? So that that image can be easily accessed within one region. But if you need to access the same image in a different region, mind you, it's your own account. Like you have access to everything. But if you want the same image in a different region, you actually have to make a copy of it and copy it over. So then they can charge you for the, for the transferring of the data from one region to the next. So yeah, actually the biggest issue is cost. When you have to move things around. Uh, cost, latency, uh, what else? Permissions. Right? Um, Permissions, because some regions 
they are not all the same. Some regions span the entire globe or the entire network. Because whenever you're using it, you have access to the same things all over the place. Like uh, there's one called IAM, the one you use, you use for permissions. That's everywhere. Right? But some, uh, for some, but some um, services, let me think of something compute. EC2, I think, yeah, EC2 and Lambda. Those are region bound. So everything you're doing with them, <coughs> uh, Amazon pretty much has designed the infrastructure in such a way that you have a nice time working in one place. But if you try and use a lambda here and a lambda in Northern Ireland, and or you try to copy things over in some shape or form, yeah, the revenue will be great. All right.